Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks so much to everybody joining us here in Miami. Uh, folks are joining us in Fort Lauderdale, in Gainesville, Florida, Tallahassee, Florida, and also up in Brooklyn, New York. And I think some folks are going to be joining us later from Sweden and other parts of the world. Um, if you're streaming from somewhere else, let us know where you're watching from. Give us a shout. Yeah. <laughs> so we are One Struggle. We're an anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist group based here in South Florida. And our aim is to build an independent mass movement of varying peoples and organizations that all unify in some way around the fact that capitalism and imperialism are our common problem and our common enemy. And we want to work to coordinate uh, our resistance to this domination and exploitation. So as a part of this effort, we started a project called Seeds of Unity on Instagram. Some of you probably follow us. Um, and maybe that's how you found out about the project. And the point of Seeds of Unity is to try to struggle for this thing, political unity, around concepts, um, not for intellectual clout, not for the sake of winning arguments, but so that we can construct a common lens of what's going on in front of us and then how we can act uh, to affect the world around us through organization, direct action, movement, and popular democratic uprising. And that's exactly why we're having this event today, to try and build unity about fascism specifically, uh, and the fascism that's developing here in the US and how we can organize to resist it. We're looking at the US specifically, but for friends watching in other parts of the world, for people here in Brazil, from Brazil, um, you'll probably find that a lot of this is applicable to the places that you're from. Uh, that said, we'll be going much deeper into fascism uh, through our Sprouting Theory series on Seeds of Unity, um, but also on our website, onestruggle.net, shameless plug, um, mm -hmm. in the coming weeks. So you can always uh, find our what we're going to talk about here. You'll find it there. You'll find it on Seeds of Unity. Um, and you can always, please, should, uh, tell us your thoughts and your opinions about any of that. Uh, so here right now we're going to give a brief presentation, about 30 minutes, uh, and then we'll have a discussion that everyone from everywhere can participate in. So we'll take questions from IG Live, YouTube Live, and here in the live audience. Um, there's a lot we're going to try and cover in a short amount of time, so if something seems incomplete or you disagree with something or you have questions, please definitely bring it up in the discussion that'll be happening after the presentation. Uh, clarification, disagreement, struggle, all of that is how we build unity. So don't be shy. We need your perspective. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Let's start with the video. Does it concern you that many people saw that tweet as racist and that uh, white nationalist groups are finding common cause with you on that point? It doesn't concern me because many people agree with me. And all I'm saying, they want to leave, they can leave. This land is our land! 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 land. Before his stint at the EPA, Wheeler was a coal lobbyist, a job he took after working for arguably the most anti-science and anti-EPA senator from Oklahoma, Republican Jim Inhofe. In case we have forgotten, because we keep hearing that 2014 has been the warmest year on record, I asked the chair, you know what this is? It's a snowball, and that's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out. Some people are calling for a local high school principal to resign. This following a Palm Beach Post article that showed emails from 2018 between a principal to a parent questioning if the Holocaust really happened. Some breaking news out of the Justice Department. The Attorney General William Barr now saying the federal government will resume the death punishment after nearly two decades. All right, uh, so obviously, 
we're in an intense moment in time right now, and a lot of us are crying fascism, but why is that? We see images on the internet proclaiming fascism is capitalism in decay and capitalism is crisis, and we share or hit the like button, but we don't maybe necessarily know what those things mean. The problem is that besides these images and proclamations, there are claims that capitalism is freedom and democracy or fascism is getting your guns taken away. According to the internet, cops are fascist, socialists are fascist, prisons are fascist, censoring nipples is fascist, Trump is a fascist, Hillary Clinton is a fascist, Bernie Sanders is a fascist, anti-fascists are fascist. You keep using the word. I do not think it means what you think it means. It can all start to feel a little insane, kind of like this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Uh, these seemingly ahistorical and wildly contradictory claims can tell us two things. Uh, most people don't seem to know what capitalism or fascism really is, and most people can't distinguish between the expressions of uh, something and the core of a phenomenon. So our aim for this presentation is to show that fasci fascism is a problem of capitalism and that because of this, our resistance to fascism has to be rooted in addressing capitalism. To do this, it means organizing outside of capitalist methods and building an independent movement, building unity, theory, politics, ideology, and action capable of banishing fascism to the realm of history forever. So to start, we're gonna drop a little bit of a bomb on you guys. Um, Trump is fascist. Gasp. <laughs> so maybe not that much of a bomb. Uh, we see him cozying up with white nationalists, appointing ultra-conservative judges, pulling uh, lobbyists and leaders of special interest groups into positions of power. It's like we've fallen into a wormhole that's brought us back in time to a version of the 1940s that somehow magically has Twitter. <laughs> Uh, but it's important for us to understand not just the fact that Trump is a fascist, but why Trump is a fascist. Despite what some historians and politicians and new news organizations propose, there is no one uniform theory of fascism. It's a tendency of capitalism, and it takes specific shape based on the unique historical and political circumstances of class struggle in a society. The fascism developing in the US will not be identical to what occurred in Germany. So instead of arguing about who or what is a neo-Nazi, we can and should be developing some general understandings of what spurs fascism and its characteristics. Hail Trump, hail our people, hail victory. <laughs> looking at Trump and those scary ass motherfuckers, um, and the rest of his social base, we can identify what we know are expressions of fascism. When we see white nationalists, anti-Semites, and arms of the government becoming increasingly militarized, we are correct to identify fascism. Nationalism, religious extremism, xenophobia, racism, Islamophobia, transphobia, and individualism are used to divide and pacify us while fascism con consolidates and takes power. Fascism requires a repressive state, brutality, increasingly antagonistic divisions, and the retraction of democratic rights in order to work. But none of these things actually fuel fascism itself. What fuels fascism or allows it to become expressed is an economic crisis of capitalism. It arises as a political and ideological form capitalism takes to deal with this crisis where two methods of accumulation are vying for power and dominance with no unity within the capitalist class over how to advance. Now, keep in mind, even without a strong fascist fraction, the capitalist class is always divided. The built-in imperative of capitalism is ever-increasing growth, profits, and expanding markets. Within the capitalist class, there are all these varying and competing interests, mostly based on how they accumulate their form of wealth or capital. It can be rooted in industry, in banking, or a mix of both. The politics we see expressed through parties, political parties, and all levels of government are representations of these competing economic interests. Now, these representations will appear to fight for morality, stability, progress, 
uh, fractions of the capitalist class will make us pawns in their game through these representations. But in reality, their solutions and propositions only serve them, not the masses. When we look at Trump's policies of economic nationalism, bringing back coal and manufacturing to the US, a focus on infrastructure projects, these are old traditional forms of accumulation that he's trying to revive in the United States. Not because he actually buys his own rhetoric, but because this sector of the capitalist class needs the return to industry in order to keep reproducing itself. This is why we're not likely to see Trump creating well-paying industry jobs after eliminating immigrant labor. He will stoke the ideology of nationalism to get American working people to think he represents their interest. Then factory and industrial labor will likely be relocated to anti-union right-to-work states, mostly in the South, and or we will see an increase in manufacturing done by exploited prison labor uh, or by robots who don't need to get paid a wage. But the solution isn't really as simple as all that. What Trump and the fascist fraction of, uh, or that he represents, is trying to address at this moment is a seemingly irresolvable contradiction between finance capital and industrial capital. Okay, so industrial capital, what is that? It's manufacturing, it's mining, it's infrastructure, that's a gif. Turning raw materials into goods and commodities produced by the working class. And this is where value actually lives, in physical goods and products, right? So this is the backbone of capitalism. And it's what drove advances in technology and increased and exploited labor force, uh, driving the industrial revolution that made capitalism the way forward and left feudalism behind, right? So capitalism, again, it requires industrial production or industrial capital. But because, remember, capitalism is always trying to expand pro markets, profits, ever faster. So banking and finance capitalists came about um, and started pushing for a new way of accumulating capital through credit, through finance, and speculation. Uh, so now there's another GIF. It's a stock market GIF. Um, and this made for much faster profits and was way cheaper than producing goods, right? Like you don't need workers, you don't need factories. It's kind of become like the heroin of the capitalist class because they get insanely wealthy incredibly quickly. So they all scramble to offer credit cards, give out loans, or buy up big bundles of debt, even though they understand and know that this is toxic for the global economy. And that's because it's not based in tangible goods. Remember that real value. It's fictitious capital that needs eventually to become grounded in something hard, in real value. So this crisis of finance capital is coupled with the fact then that industrial capital also has to continue to expand ever faster. And then we see this contending with the physical limits of the natural world, right? Global climate change. So the reality is there isn't really enough physical production that could anchor the insane amounts of speculative and finance capital being accumulated. So this is why we're calling it a structural crisis. It's different from the past because the very imperatives that are inherent to capitalism are contending with a complete breakdown of the economy, of society, and our planet. So now capitalists have known about this crisis for a while. We want to advance the slide, but they are divided over how to resolve it. So as they work to navigate their differences, compete, mudslinging battles, they lean on us trying to rally us to one side or another with health care for all or gutting Obamacare, right? The Green New Deal or destroy big government, uh, immigration reform or build the wall. So the reality though is none of these alternatives actually get to that core of capitalism and that crisis that we just outlined. That's the core of the problem. So each of these alternatives ultimately will reinforce some profit interest of a sector of the capitalist class while encouraging us, the people, to stay focused on the expressions of capitalism rather than capitalism as the itself. Uh, there's this crisis of finance capital. We're going back and forth. People are trying to tell us to pick a side, but ultimately, none of these alternatives are getting to the core of the problem. We're just keeping us focused on the expression of capitalism rather than capitalism itself. So next slide. So this just happened yesterday. Um, Trump is trying to say that Antifa is a terrorist organization and make it illegal. 
So as this crisis gets more acute, we're going to see more repression. We're going to see division, the manipulation of people's rights, things we associate with fascism, right? But these are also inherent to capitalism. So even during times when, say, there's a more liberal domination, think Obama era, when economic prosperity maybe doesn't require this brutal form of oppression. The distinction is that fascist ideology is like capitalist ideology on steroids. So it gets rid of any of those liberal concessions. So it's like bootstraps, deregulation, privatization, patriotism to the max. Next image. It creates a social base blind to reality, ready to blame all of these crises and problems that are rooted in capitalism and imperialism on, on some other, whether that's the poor, the lazy, liberals, immigrants. Next image. Trump and his social base are working to consolidate fascism, but we have to recognize that the conditions for it have been in development way before his candidacy. Republican, Democrat, third party, it doesn't matter which it is, they will all end up serving capitalist interests. And we are facing this problem because of capitalism, not because of any single politicians or parties. So the reality is that as long as we live in a class divided society like this, these contradictions of domination and exploitation, all for the gain of the capitalist class and their ever increasing wealth, we're going to keep repeating history. So we've got to break out of it. OK. so. To sum up a little bit, uh, fascism is consolidating, and capitalism is the root of the problem. The next thing we have to recognize is that we can't use capitalist solutions to resolve the problems caused by capitalism. The means, that means that new markets and voting them out aren't real options for us. We have to resist the capitalist alternatives that are represented by electoral politics. We're facing this situation because we've become disorganized as the masses or the people. Um, we're disorganized against what we should be, which is a meaningful social force. We've handed our power over to people who don't represent us rather than wielding it ourselves. Now, we were talking earlier about how the capitalist class is always divided. Elections under capitalism are for resolving that division and the internal struggles among the capitalist class that arise out of those divisions. Uh, those elections distract us with secondary differences rather than focusing on the fundamental problem that society is facing. And you can't just vote out fascism. Vote out fascism, sorry. <laughs> Trump and company have worked to fill lifelong appointments in the ju judiciary system and have galvanized a social base who won't just go away because Democrats are elected to office. Remember, fascism has come about due to the economic mess that capitalists have put us in. And none of the Democrats' policies or proposals for health care for all, uh, immigration reforms, and women's rights actually address this. We can see representatives like... Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders as perhaps well-meaning, but they're not in office to dismantle the system that pays their paychecks. They also don't have the kind of perspective to resolve the contradictions coming to a head right now because their solutions mostly focus on, again, expressions of capitalism and fascism rather than the core of those phenomena themselves. Okay, so what do we mean by that? We're gonna dive a little bit more into this kind of abstract concept of addressing expressions of a thing rather than the thing itself. And so this is important. We're reemphasizing it because if we want to hit the mark with our organizing and don't want to be funneled down an unintended path, we have to make sure we're getting to the core of the problems we're trying to address, right? So we talked a few minutes ago about how in industry, industrial capital, it's the backbone of capitalism, right? Because it's the only thing that can create real value. And that value comes through the process of exploitation. Capitalists drive wages down as low as they possibly can and take the lion's share of the value produced in that process for the commodity. And that contradiction between that unpaid labor that creates the thing and the surplus value that the capitalists steal, uh, this is the core of capitalism. And that core permeates everything surrounding us now. It's what built this building. It's the clothes we're wearing, the chairs we're sitting in, the universities we attend, our cell phones. This process permeates all of it. 
So here in the US, because of imperialism and the offshoring of a lot of production, we don't see this as much. So we're kind of separated from this production process. And this means often that we tend to focus on other aspects of capitalism that are removed from the core, even if they're related to it. Next image. So this is what we're seeing now with identity politics, uh, with immigration policy, environmental issues. In terms of our current understanding of capitalism, Mistaking expressions for phenomena typically keep us from being able to identify our common enemy, the capitalist class, and getting organized in our own interests. So often what we see instead is we get wrapped up in our own individual existence and carving out a more equitable placement within capitalism for ourselves, and we tend to lose sight or have any conception of what collective liberation could be. So then there's also, all right, so we really want to address capitalism, and we're going to poke at that. We're going to try to get to it. Again, this focus on expressions of capitalism instead of the core can take us into some tricky territory. So for an example of what we mean, we can look at the environmental movement, which has largely embraced capitalism as hugely problematic, right? That's pretty easy to see. So next slide, and probably the next one too. Yep. Okay, here we are. So obviously, rampantly using up finite resources and massive waste are qualities of capitalism that environmentalists have beef with, right? So we see struggles for conservation, uh, reducing emissions, making production more sustainable for the planet, getting away from single-use plastics, but none of these actually, again, get to that core and resolve the contradictions of capitalism because they're not getting to that core, that exploitation of the working class. So raw materials don't create commodities. Human beings do, workers do. And often they do it for really meager wages in terrible conditions, dangerous often. So tapping the earth dry while simultaneously poisoning it, poisoning it, these are expressions of capitalism that could morph and develop into something potentially more sustainable. But again, it would reinforce a profit motive. So if we only address the expressions, we may come out on the other side of this with a planet that's not on fire, but that's only livable for a very distinct portion of the population on it, of distinct class. So this focus on expressions is also why it's possible for environmentalism or any movement to potentially carry a fascist tendency. So what does that mean? Literally, we can have eco-fascism. Um, and again, this isn't unique to the environmental movement. Maybe it can seem like a stretch that Hitler's blood and soil chant can actually extend into a modern context, but eco-fascism, much like capitalism itself, disregards human life as part of an autocratic approach to the crisis of capitalism's ever-increasing need for expansion and consumption. So what does this mean? We hear things like proposals for human population control and a, quote, natural survival of the fittest approach to famine and natural disasters, as well as ethnocentric calls to reclaim and return to the land. These are fascistic tendencies. So if we advance to the slide, this is from our Seeds of Unity account. This is someone who was commenting on a post we made about fascism. Um, so you see that they are, you know, these are all of the different things that they are advocating, very fascistic, and also promoting protection of the environment. So when I looked at his page to understand his perspective, he is openly advocating for eugenics, to eliminate incorrect genes and reproduce society with the correct genes. And do you know what genes those are? Guess, white genes. This is what we're swimming in, y'all. So it's very real. <laughs> and this isn't the only eco-fascist uh, we've encountered. And what these eco-fascists show us is the populist tendency to swing far left or far right when we don't address the core of class struggle. That's because mistaking expressions for the phenomena itself allows for even progressive ideas to end up serving fascism. Uh, and we can see other examples of this. Movements centered around racism, for example, have brought us Martin Luther King Jr., as well as extreme black Hebrew Israelites. In the case of King, his involvement in integrating black folks into capitalism by demanding the state recognize their democratic rights made him realize the class antagonisms at the root of that struggle and racialized oppression in general, which is why he later uh, began the Poor People's Campaign, uniting all poor people. 
but institutions like the Israelite School of Practical Knowledge or the Nation of Yahweh conversely take racial oppression as evidence of white people's inherent evil, which justifies hate, separatism, and even extermination. Without an understanding of class divisions and their tendencies, we can easily spiral out into the extreme complexities of each of these expressions, which do have their own discrete histories and justifications, and not all of those are completely devoid of reasoning rooted in the real world. Uh, oppression is real. Environmental degradation is real but they are also expressions of a global social arrangement that doesn't serve just men or just white people or simply corporations. Capitalism and imperialism have historically constructed different facets of oppression and exploitation in order to divide us, to dominate us and keep us disorganized so much so that we can't even agree on what has its boot on our throats. So, uh, hopefully after all of that, uh, we've convinced you that in order to combat fascism, we have to address capitalism, because fascism is capitalism just with rabies and on steroids. <laughs> and we know that capitalist solutions like electoral politics aren't going to get us there. We have to address the core of our issues, which lie at the core of capitalism itself. Rather than capitalist alternatives, what we need is a truly progressive alternative collectively constructed by the masses, exploited and dominated by capitalism. P.S. That's us. <laughs> uh, and we can do that by uh, combating fascist and capitalist conceptions and ideas, and by asserting our political power as a unified social force. Okay, we can all go home now. We, we did, did it. it. <laughs> Just kidding, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> It worked, sorry. Yeah, no, that's not, that's, that's not, not the end. That's not, that's not the end. <laughs> um, so Next just, slide. just kidding. Because this is not work that we can do on our phones or on our computers. There is no number of books you could read or Instagram and Twitter accounts you could follow that, or protests that you could attend that will lead to the mass movement we need to confront fascism, capitalism, and imperialism. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> This is the scene playing out in cities across the country, neighbors taking on ICE agents. In Nashville, they formed this human chain, successfully blocking two immigration agents from taking away a father who's lived here for the last 14 years. He was inside the white van with his son. All of us just came together and we did the right thing. When they did it for a million other families, we'll do it today, we'll do it tomorrow. New rules from Homeland Security mean that as many as 300,000 unauthorized immigrants now have a greater chance of being deported. The government is expediting deportations for immigrants who can't prove that they've been in the country for at least two years. Federal authorities point out that there were more of these forced removals under the Obama administration. So the forces that we're facing, forces like ICE and other arms of the state, they require us to be organized, uh, to be capable of resisting fascism while also working towards a new arrangement of society. We need organization. It cannot be done individually. And the way we organize should be shaped and determined by the future we wanna build. One free of class divisions and other false divisions along the lines of race, gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, a world where everyone is empowered to engage and to lead, one in which we have a new conception of what democracy means and what it looks like. We want a world where our very mode of existing as a society does not hinge on the exploitation of people and planet. So in organizing now, we cannot replicate capitalist structures and practices like bureaucratic relationships, competition, and individualism. Instead, we need to be building the embryo of a new social or new social relationships and structures for a different society. Okay, and so for us, the backbone of this work, right, of trying to build new structures, new relationships, is something we call political unity. And to us, the basic idea is that you can't have collective work, democratic relationships or organization if you don't have a common level of agreement. Otherwise, you're just following someone else's ideas or someone else's orders. And we've got to understand where we agree 
and where we disagree, and then build our common work on those areas of agreement. And then we go out into the world and we test those ideas, and we learn together, and we do that over and over. The process is dynamic and never ends. And political unity also is not passive. Next slide. It's based on struggle. We demarcate from our other people's positions and alternatives, and we work to democratically convince folks of ours. If we want to build democratic organization, we have to win people over to our ideas, to adopt them as their own, and most importantly, to contribute to them, to develop them. So this means no one should ever be asked to do something that they don't have unity with. It means we should never impose our perspective. That's what fascists do. <laughs> we can't convince people with incentives or empty promises. We have to be patient, and we have to allow people to have their own experiences, to come to their own conclusions, to confirm, reject, or develop our perspectives. And most importantly, developing political unity means that we constantly have to criticize our efforts, and we have to be open to criticism from others. So building off this idea of political unity and where we agree, we have to recognize there will always be differences. In a social movement, but even in this room, there will be varying levels of political unity and consciousness. We can try and squeeze everyone into one giant organization uh, where everyone has to agree to one perspective, but then others are gonna be squeezed out. There needs to be space for a range of perspectives and ways for people to plug in and play a role in whatever capacity they can, from progressive to revolutionary. One struggle, hi, uh, uh, is an intermediate level group. So we share unity uh, around a common problem, which we identify as capitalism and imperialism, and we work to understand it and build a movement to resist it. But beyond that level of unity, uh, many of us diverge. We'll, we don't really see eye to eye on what the future will look like or how exactly we'll get to that future. Understanding our unity allows people with a range of ideas to organize and work co effectively together without spending valuable time arguing about a future that realistically we are pretty far away from. We feel the intermediate level is an important form of organization to have, especially at the moment when political and class consciousness is at an all-time low. This form of organization can help to be the embryo of a mass movement, germinating consciousness and lots of different forms of organization. Okay, so we're growing organization. It's based on political unity. You're together, right? You're ready to do something. So what, what is our objective as an organization? What do we do? Um, it's not just about taking action, that's a part of it. But without theory or a guide, we can often end up right where we started. Remember Alice in Wonderland? <laughs> so this is what we call the activism loop, right? It's action for action's sake. Um, and no theory. So we move from protest to protest, action to action, expecting that an amalgamation of action will take us to the organization and movement that we need. But throwing milkshakes, uh, punching Nazis, that action is positive, but it's not going to take us where to, we need to go. Yes, resistance will be part of our movement, but that resistance has to have progressive ideas and hypotheses behind it. So as an organization, we have to be able to collectively develop theory about what's in front of us, how we want to alter it, where we need to go, and how we're going to get there. And again, as we've kind of been emphasizing, for us, an understanding of class and class interests is really integral in this process. So we construct these theories based on direct knowledge and indirect knowledge. So what we're experiencing now in our lived reality uh, and also what we can learn from others, uh, past and present. Um, but theory, again, on its own is useless. I'm sure you have had plenty of moments like this where it leads to endless intellectual debates. So our theory has to be determined and refined by practice and our own experience in the real world. And we also have to be ready and willing to change, to adjust, and maybe even throw out our, our theories when reality shows us they are wrong. So from theory, right, we've got our theory, we develop a political line. This is another concept we use. It's like the general trajectory towards working towards our objectives. So for example, this idea of the intermediate level organization, it's part of our political line for building a mass movement. It's not a blueprint or a dogmatic plan with point A, point one A, none of that. It's a flexible and general guide that we are constantly changing. So the key 
the big key about political line is that it exists whether we think about it or not. So a political line can be constructed intentionally, like the theory of the intermediate level, which we constantly struggle to put into practice and refine, uh, or it can exist unintentionally, like when you're just pissed and you go to a protest and you don't know what's gonna happen, but you just gotta do something. Uh, but every idea and every theory inherently has a political application or trajectory. We have to be able to understand these political extensions and repercussions of theories and ideas. We've become dominated by a culture of sound bites and too often we limit our understanding of complex realities to that as well. On the internet, at protests, we find slogans to address our problems, but we rarely think about the theory underpinning these slogans and the potential political lines that can extend from them. Shut it down, abolish ICE, workers of the world unite, save the planet, destroy capitalism. But how do we make any of these things happen? There are a myriad of interpretations and methods of accomplishing all of these things, and some of those methods will take us in directions we really don't wanna go. So this is why ideology, the other half of our progression forward, becomes really important, and it gets left out a lot of times. It's huge in making sure that we're constructing an intentional political line rather than falling into an unintentional one. And when we confront the ideologies we've been given by this dominant social arrangement and actually become capable of resisting them, we can start to discern which theories and practices will actually work for our objectives instead of feeding, feeding into the bogus ideas that keep us dominated. So we should clarify, when we say ideology, you might think, oh, that means capitalism, that means socialism or communism. We mean it in a more broad sense. For us, ideology is the subjective lens through which you see yourself and the world around you. It's your subjective interpretation of the objective reality around you. There can be a million lenses, right? Um, so, every societal transformation, every revolution, every social movement has carried with it an ideology. It's a vision in which people can see themselves, their interests, and a possible different future. Our ability to build a real and powerful movement will hinge on our capacity to bring an ideology that people choose to adopt, that they take, adapt, and run with it, and that they can develop themselves. So let's go to Robert Ray. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yep. Okay. This is Robert Ray. He's a head of the Daily Stormer, a neo Nazi media organization. So we're seeing an intensification of fascist ideology that is trying to normalize and build acceptance of a level of violence, racism, and xenophobia that we can easily see escalating into something far more dangerous than just a chant of send them home. We can sense and we can observe a correlation to what happened in Nazi Germany. Prior to concentration camps and human incinerators, there was a very violent ideology that set the stage for those kinds of actions. So to destroy fascism, we can't just beat up Nazis. This will be part of it. But we have to destroy their ideas. At the same time, we have to rally people to ours. So this is TPUSA, Turning Point USA. Uh, they're founded by Charlie Kirk, uh, who's formerly affiliated with Breitbart News. And TPUSA's mission is to build the most organized, active, and powerful conservative grassroots activist network on college and high school campuses across the country. Here in Florida, they are present at every state university. They are present on every Miami-Dade College campus. So you look at these kids, they're not Nazis and they likely don't consider themselves part of the alt-right. But the political line of these ideas are fascism. They reinforce fascism. And they are serving as foot soldiers, many of them unknowingly, to spread this ideology. So we're seeing Nazis on university campus, or the, the, the beginnings of Nazis. Uh, and we're generally seeing this intensification, which is freaking all of us out and everyone is looking for alternatives. We have to be capable of exposing and breaking down some of these alternatives that come from really backwards ideas, and at the same time, we have to be capable of showing a progressive path forward. Our resistance and existence depends on our ability to shake capitalist ideology of individualism, competition, passivity, and escapism. 
We have to be able to recognize ourselves in relation to a collective. Rather than building followers, we must build a multitude of leaders. Everyone has the capacity to lead when empowered to do so. We hold the power to make societal change, but first, we have to take the uncomfortable step of doing something no one has taught us how to do, which is to resist. When we share political unity, even in small numbers, we can be incredibly impactful. I mean, think of the neighbors that were resisting the ICE agents. We can be creative in our resistance, and we can be powerful. We need to start counting on our own strength individually and collectively. We have to start thinking independently to build our own theory, politics, ideology, and organizations. We need to start from the ground up getting organized in our schools, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and elsewhere. So this is how we can construct a movement. Webs and networks of organizations, structures, and individuals coordinating resistance based on those varying levels of political unity. And it's through this organization, this concrete form, that we can struggle to build new ideas, new practices for society. It's how we start the work of breaking down false divisions of racism, misogyny, transphobia, xenophobia. When we have political unity, a collective ideology, and strong networks of organization and mutual support, we can begin to provide an alternative to the current arrangement of society. So right now, it seems like we're watching society devolve, right? It feels like we are going backwards in time rather than forwards. The fact that we are in this room, we need to acknowledge the fact that we're able to have this conversation has been made possible by, by progressives, militants, and revolutionaries from the past who organized and fought back. They resisted the dominant ideas of the time and pushed for a progressive path forward. So now it is our turn to do the same. So the time to get involved is now. Stop making justifications for why you cannot do anything and join the struggle in whatever way you can. There are a myriad of ways. Let's figure out if we have unity and let's build common work. Let's organize to resist capitalism, imperialism, and fascism. Let's struggle for a new direction, one that we collectively shape together. So what we're asking you to do is to join us. And when we say us, we mean the people. We're asking you to stand up, to fight back, and to organize, because our future truly does depend on it. And thank you. That's the, that's the for real, for real end. <laughs> so with that, we want to switch over to a discussion. Um, and we want to call it discussion, because we don't want it to be a, it's not a question and answer. Um, it's thoughts, criticisms. Um, what you're thinking. So we're going to do this between, oh, I stepped out of the live stream. We're going to go back and forth between, like we said, the live room here in Miami and then folks online. So if you're watching online, um, you know, enter your comments either on YouTube or on Instagram Live. So does anybody in Miami want to lead us off? Thoughts? It can be a, just like a raw emotional response, a criticism. Okay. Do you mind coming up to the mic? Hi. Oh, this isn't. OK, cool. And so I realized that like I probably look like my dad with all these keys right now. Um, OK, wonderful. Hey. Um, so I'm, I'm from here, and I, I'm working with um, different groups and organizations. And I have a lot of the same um, uh, kind of struggles internally, thinking about like, which group do I belong to? And it's kind of like it doesn't really make sense to me. Um, a lot of the times I feel like, I love all these people and all of their ideas make sense, whether they're anarchists or whatever, anti-imperialists or socialists or communists or whatever. I think for the most part we understand. Um, so I, I feel really comforted knowing that I can be in Miami and I can be in my home understanding that there are people who are having this similar um, kind of um, internal dialogue, I suppose. And um, I absolutely agree that um, we should be organizing and we should be doing that under a democratic process. I don't know that's a, a really loaded term, but it just to, to understand that like we should all have a, an equal voice. And again, all of these are gonna be loaded terms, but I would love to see it where 
people like us and people who are struggling and people who are on the street and people who are not represented um, generally have a say in how this city is run because right now we're going in a really, really, really bad direction to say the least. And so I, I feel very touched and I'm very grateful for the space that you've created. Thank you. Thanks. So I guess I just wanted to respond. I agree. And I think that, you know, to actually accomplish what you're talking about where Miami is run by us <laughs> means that we really have a lot of work to do. That takes a lot of organization, right? It takes centralization. It takes um, understanding where we agree. It, it's going to take some struggle. Right? So we need to be practicing and exercising that muscle now. Of You said there's all of these groups, right? But do we know what each other are doing? Do we know where we agree, where we disagree? Where can we coordinate? Like here in Miami and wherever you're watching from, there shouldn't be one political event today, right? There should be an event today. There should be one tomorrow. There should be one next week. They should be going off all over. And we should be coordinating that together, right? Because somewhere there's some level of agreement that we can operate on. Again, there will be differences, and those are our strengths as well. Um, but we have to start moving forward because otherwise, you know, we're going to sit here watching people develop our, our city <laughs> as we're sinking and sit here twiddling our thumbs saying, oh, we should do something, right? Any other thoughts? Questions from online? Okay, Rose is going to read an. Um. So we have a question online from Gainesville, actually. Oh, it's for Gainesville. It's, um, I'm sorry, I'm giving you all my bags. <laughs> uh, Gainesville is asking if we could do a short reiteration of the section with finance versus industry because the audio was cut off and I don't know if any folks here still have some questions about that. Okay, yeah. Um, basically, uh, Part of the root of fascism, well, the root of fascism is this uh, seemingly unresolvable contradiction between finance capital and industrial capital. Is this the part that they were talking about? Um, so industrial capital is the production of goods. It's where the core of capitalism is uh, because workers make goods and it's the um, sort of the surplus value that capitalists steal from workers that creates the sort of core of capitalism. Um, this core is coupled with banking, which, uh, and finance, speculation, that's credit, debt, all of that, um, which can accumulate capital incredibly quickly, but it's also fictitious capital. So th these two are contradictory to each other, and at the moment, um, it's, <laughs> I want to make sure I don't have to say it if we're good with the, okay. Um, so uh, this contradiction is seemingly unresolvable because there actually isn't enough physical goods, commodities, property. There isn't enough to actually anchor the incredible crazy wealth that's being produced by finance and speculation. So um, we have these two different sort of sects of the capitalist class that are, are vying for one form of accumulation over the other, but in reality, both are toxic and messed up, and uh, the root problem is capitalism itself. Cool. Do you have a question or a Definitely. Well, it's for yeah. the people at home. Oh, so it's for the people. Oh, okay, so it does have, sorry about that, for the noise you just made. Um, okay. So I would say this, uh, definitely capitalism as a system is done with, right, in the sense that it's, it's good, quote unquote good, positive things that it did, have already kind of been wasted away, it's been a long time, our planet is about to get destroyed and whatnot. And so definitely the finance capitalists, the imperialists, are the most at the head of this and the most to profit from, I, I would say, the status quo. So I would say that the best way to unite us uh, and we're going to have disagreements and all of that. But let the disagreements be in practice. And I think our unity should come in opposition to the finance capitalists. That is to say, in opposition to the imperialists, which are abundant in, in Miami. I mean, Miami has spies all over. Miami has infiltrators all, all over. You know what I'm saying? If, if you're making noise in Miami, you will have an infiltrator. I 100% guarantee it, right? So my view is, is that... Practice will unite us, struggle among each other will unite us, but it's like everybody has to point their quote-unquote gun, right, quote-unquote, at the imperialists. 
always at the imperialists, always in defense of national liberation movements, which are objectively anti-imperialist in general, not always, right? There's the Kurdish struggle and those struggles that sell out to US imperialism. But in general, we can always unite under that banner. And uh, I think you will find a lot of people that can unite again around that because you can make it a question of what? Of racism. You can make it a question of what? Of a lack of democracy. There's a lot of ample material that that struggle gives us. Before we get to the question from a live stream, does anybody have like a thought or response to that? Maybe something that connects to that? I'll have Carlos first and I'll get to you because he had his hand up before. There we go. Let's see how far. Is there any consensus in the Um, can, can people at home hear me? Yes? Oh, yeah. Um, so I wanted to add, because I think someone had initially like a question about um, finance capital versus industrial capital, and I just wanted to provide some, like um, I guess, concrete examples of the we can point to with that, like the 2008 market crash, wherein we had people essentially creating these like stocks that were filled with like people who did own homes, and it was in some way tied to homes, but not entirely objectively tied to the homes. So the finance capitalists thought that, you know, the old saying is, it's like, it's safe as houses. Like, that's literally the way that they would describe investments, is that they would say, it is as safe as a house so they were like well what can we do we can literally invest in houses and develop literally like phantasmal capital that doesn't really exist so they would have that industrial capital i think when we think about it would be something along the lines of like when we start thinking about shortages of raw com like material commodity goods where we start like not having iron or we might not have oil or we might not have um some other sort of like commodity uh like cotton for textile production i think that's where we start to get the thing but the thing is that there is a world of international um capital that builds off of that and i think that there was um Another quick point that I wanted to address as well is that in many ways it's there is still a way that a lot of the capitalist class works consistently to try to pacify worker consciousness wherein we uh, may not think about that, right? So even when we utilize media outlets and we utilize um, other forms of media in order to develop cohesive ideas, these media outlets are still manufacturing the popular consent. It's still this bourgeois thought that's developed at the top and then is disseminated from the top down to the bottom. And so even the level of radical freedom, it's like the conception of our freedom is still determined and defined on their terms when we think of freedom because what freedom looks like is still defined on those terms. So I just wanted to add those two things. Nothing. And then, and then we'll get to, oh, you got it? Uh, I'm going to piggyback from what he just said on the concept of freedom. Uh, freedom is a class concept. Uh, you fight for it or you gain it. And I think in the struggle there, we need to understand, distinguish democracy to bourgeois democratic rights. Demo democracy is an abstract. And I'm going to say something. Most of people here may disagree with me. Dem democracy is the, is the dictatorship of, the, of a class. You have the freedom to speak. You have the freedom to travel in the United States simply because it benefits the, the, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class. You have no power, meaning that you have no position to take a decision. You vote Obama. He says he's not going to go to war. He went to war, and what did, what did the world do? We sat on our asses because he's got the power. We ain't got shit. Power is holding, controlling the society in a way in your best interest. So democracy is the dictatorship of a class. Now, under that democracy, we have democratic rights. For example, the six-hour movement, the eight-hour movement, the minimum wage, is a democratic right. We fought for it. The civil rights movement is a democratic right. Black people, women, although we call this society a democracy, didn't have the right to vote. So they got that democratic right in the 50s. And black people are still <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I, don't, I hate to use the concept black people because I don't think there is a such, such a thing. But there's a class. But at the same time, I'm going to use it to make it easy. But please don't take me as a word for that. Uh, we were able to vote in the, late six, in the 60s. But most of us in the South 
didn't have that right to vote and still doesn't have that right to vote. So if we think the United States is democracy, then we are saying black people ain't shit. Because when the time we were saying this is the best democracy in the world, they did not have the right to vote. So how the hell are we going to agree with that concept that we are living in the best democracy of the world, then there are some people excluded from that democracy. So my interpretation of the democracy is power. Whoever got the fucking power is the one that, has, that are benefited from that democracy. We have democratic rights. We could go call this morning and call American Airlines and buy a fucking ticket and travel because it benefits them. You got to use a credit card. The bank is going to be happy. American Airlines is going to be happy. So there's a distinction. And, and there's another point I'd like to add about idea. Idea is not a theory. In, in theory, there are ideas. Idea, theory is a scientific method of analyzing a reality. Okay? And we, we need to use that scientific method in order to have a political line. If we don't use that scientific method, there will be no political line, or at least there will be pragmatist people, activists, having action. So it doesn't mean also that theory is untouchable. Theory is alive as well as the reality that that theory is attempting to interpret is, uh, is alive as well. So an idea that was 100 years ago cannot be valuable. Same thing now. There must be some development. Mm -hmm. So theory and reality are both alive. But the problem here in our time is the fact that theory as the reality of surpassed the theory greatly. We are all using fucked up theories that are good theories that were foundation 50 or 100 years ago. And we are not adapting it. And nobody now knows what United States fascism looked like because it is new. We can call Lenin, although they are dead, Marx or any other th theoretician to tell us what the United States fascist is. It is your job, our job here, to know what is United States fascism is. The uh, fascism in Germany was not the same. Here we, we have some bourgeois democratic rights that the people fought or came from the contradiction between the capitalist class. And guess what? Now Trump is trying to destroy them, to destroy them, in order for him to achieve his brain of fascism. Steve Bannon said it. We are destructing what is now existing. So the immigration question is not simply Im about immigration. It's about destroying a structure that existed. The school system is being destroyed by divorce. It is about destroying a democratic structure in the interest of the capitalist class because it does, fascists need something centralized. They don't need that fucking bullshit. You don't need to pray. You need to pray. They don't need this. And divorce is doing it. Best to divorce. Housing. This guy is doing it. And now there's another tendency that is really dangerous. They try to move a bunch of government entities to another state. What does that mean? So we could sit here and talk about fascism all we want. But we don't know what fascism without having a disciplined theoretical work to see what is in front of us, what is happening now. How do we deal with it? And how do we construct a political line from what we have? And to, to, to answer this brother here, I don't think at this time there, is, there will be unity among different groups. Each group has to do their own. Unity will come. But at this time, it's not possible. Oh, yeah, I have a mic here. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we had a question from Tallahassee. I hope they're still connected. I lost the live feed for a little bit. I'm sorry. Um, she was asking that based on someone who works in, in a capitalist system, 
right? Because we can't escape the idea of our, our jobs and our reality. What are some things that she can do or that they can do under that structure? Um, Alia, if you can hear me and if you want to repose your question, because I lost it on the live feed. But more or less, that was the idea. So we didn't get to choose this society, right? We were all born into it. I was born into capitalism. Who else was? OK, oh, all of us. Surprise. <laughs> so, But that doesn't mean that society can't change. And it doesn't mean that we can't push for something different. Capitalists did the very same thing. Feudalism existed before them, right? But they organized. They built an ideology. And they rallied people around these concepts of private property. Of, uh, of individual wages and um, selling your labor, things like this, right? So what is our ideology going to be? And to figure that out, we have to build organization. So all of us are going to contribute. Uh, like the point isn't to like guilt yourself around going to your job. Everybody has to pay their bills because if you don't, you will get kicked out of your house, right? This is the violence of the system we live in. This is capitalism. So, but it starts by like those neighbors, you know, that we saw online, um, starting to build organization, to build political unity, so that you do create space to resist. And we are starting to build these structures that maybe can transition us into something different. But we won't know what that looks like until we start doing it. There's no real blueprint, right? Because we have to build it ourselves. And anybody that comes to you with a blueprint, you should be weary of them. <laughs> Uh, because that has to be co built through a lot of people's participation, not by one person coming with a solution. So I don't know if that answered the question. So uh, Malia just wrote back from Tallahassee again. It's not what we can do in the structure, but what are the first steps while we're in the system for survival? So like Sarah was saying, it's just the basics of that. There's no blueprint on how we do this. We have to figure it out as we go. And just the fact that we're connected here and we can openly have this conversation and for now a safe space. It's the beginning of something. It's the beginning of organization. I mean, an organization starts with two people, right? That's the, that's the beginning of an organization. Two people and a plan. We can make it more deep than that, but you know, if you are in a workplace and there are issues with your workplace, start an organization. You know, if there's something happening in your neighborhood, start an organization, talk to your neighbors. It starts in this very, we have a lot of work to do, to be real. I was talking about it with some folks before the event. We walk down the street here in Miami and people don't even acknowledge each other. And we're talking about running a city or taking power. We have to start talking to each other as a very starting point. And that might seem really microscopic, but we also have to recognize where we're starting from. Um, so I think that the question is like, what can we do, right, concretely, like in our everyday lives? Oh, can you, oh, sorry, so I just didn't want to like overwhelm the mic and the view, sorry. Um, so so um, I think that like the question, just to make sure that I'm understanding, is like, what can we do very concretely in like our everyday lives, like seeing that like we are all in many ways like contributing to the development of capitalism if we work as like whatever sort of individual, like if we're involved in finance capital, we're involved in it. Um, I think like one is, to answer that like, and I'm gonna open it with a quote and it might not be like people who hate quoting theory might not like it, but it's like men make history but they do not make it as they choose, right? Like there are certain historical conditions that we enter into that are not of our own choosing, but simultaneously we have the capacity and power to change it. What I like to do, and this is not gonna work for everything, right? Cause I don't think you can have a, a, a like a, a debate with fascists, but like there are people who are, I would say like fascist vulnerable, like people who are starting to develop certain fascist ideas and there, I think I would like to bring it back to the dialectics. We can enter into a conversation with people who are not on the extreme absolute right fringes. If you have a family member who has some maybe mildly racist views, you can't talk about that. Like that is a dialectical process. Like historical material reality is always engaged in a dialectical process, right? If you have water and you add fire to it, you get boiling water. Like that's just kind of the way that I've interpreted the world's working around me. And I've had friends who are Trump supporters who I've managed to, of course, and like I wanna preface this and really emphasize it. I'm not saying enter into dialogue with like fascists and white supremacists, but there are people who are vulnerable to that 
and you can orient them away from it. And I think that insofar as like unity, um, fascism is an external contradiction. There is unity that can be built against this external contradiction, even though we might all have our own kind of leftist ideas of what that's supposed to look like. When we face an external contradiction, we have to, I mean, it's essentially what Mao did, right, is that when there were Japanese forces uh, invading China, the nationalist forces, the communist forces joined together to face off against this imperialist force, and that that is an external contradiction. So I think that engaging in a conversation with people who are not absolutely far fringe extremists, like, you can help and combat that a lot, because at the end of the day, like, popular media is already using its mass complex, directing people towards certain ideological pipelines, where it's like, if you just watch, I'm sure a lot of people have heard of it, like, if you just watch one YouTube video with, like, PewDiePie, you'll start getting, like, white supremacist, like, recommendations in your subscription feed for some reason, um, and that's just the reality. Like, there are some ways we can begin to combat this, at least very slightly. Yeah, um, hello. Uh, I guess I was, um, I wanted to, I guess, uh, first vocalize that I like that this is taking place because um, one of the things that uh, fascists will begin to do as they gain power is take this away from us, our ability to just meet and share in a collective anything. That's what we saw in Germany. And um, I, I agree with what the gentleman said previously about we haven't. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> I agree with the idea that this is what we're seeing now is something new and that what we might have to do in my mind is come up with some new um, uh, practices to combat what we're seeing. Um, but it was mentioned before that um, it begins with dialogue and I think that that is um, the most important part because when we start to recognize one another at, at where we are, we can begin to um, we have to uh, I, I guess I, I, my, my biggest fear is that um, a lot of this stuff gets left in an intellectual sphere. Like we can leave this space and we disseminate again. I don't I, I may never see any of you again. And that's um, exactly what the, I, I don't know exactly, but technology and society and the, the, the social strata and everything is, it feels like it's designed to keep um, mass movement disseminated and to keep people from organizing against anything. I mean, there have been union busters and I mean, we've all seen it. We all know the history of preventing mass movement. Um, what I was thinking as I was listening to everything is that all of these ideas are practical. Practicable. Where can we take this stuff once we leave here? What 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 can we do? Um, and I think I heard it. Like we we really do need to start acknowledging one another um, in a very real sense because that is what is being taken away from us in my personal experience and my opinion because. A lot of the experiences in this country, none of us are familiar with, like uh, the people involved in the prison industrial complex. I don't know how many sex workers are present, but you know, sex slavery and, and things of that nature are a real reality in this country. And so often, you know, homelessness, so many things aren't represented in groups like this. And we forget that that's a large part of what keeps capitalism going the way it, it, it is going, is that uh, those groups um, aren't represented. Um, so I, I feel as though, um, you know, just recognizing um, one another as, as we leave. I, I don't really have a solution. I'm not coming here with a solution, but I, I heard that said before, and I thought it was really positive, because I don't want to get on the idea that um, the state or capitalists or any other group has power. I really believe that the people have the power. We're not taxed for no reason. You know what I mean? Like if we all, we all exist in a system where we're paying someone's debt, debt that, that was accrued hundreds of years before any of us were, were born. That, that's really the reality. There's a system set up so that we have to work to pay off a national debt. And, um, there's 
something we can do about it, but it, it begins with recognizing individuals, because, um, you know, individuals are the ones that are being exploited, whether it, whether it be at work, whether it be at home. I mean, some people are, are capable of not having to work in an office or at a restaurant or a bar or whatever, but they still have bills to pay. There's still gas that has to go into a car that has to be registered at the DMV, which means they can take it at any time. You still have to obey laws. You know, we're, we're constantly under the thumb of a system that is really, um, it's based on debt. And that seems strange to me. So uh, I was just, I wanted to not take away from what I heard before, but I don't, I don't want to say that power lies outside of any of us. There's more power here in what we could do once we leave this space than I think, you know, there's a reason why groups like this get busted up. There's real power present now. And, uh, just to piggyback off of what you're saying, I think that what we're talking about um, is a potential for power, and I think that um, what I was thinking about with that first question that we got about like, what do we do if we're all sort of enmeshed and entrenched in this capitalist system? Like, it makes me think about struggle and how we've all forgotten, or have never actually, we never knew. Um, what it means to struggle. We tried to bring it up in the beginning of the presentation. We try to talk about it when we're talking about building political unity. But um, a, a large way that we tap into that potential power is by building our capacity to struggle. Um, and that means that if we are gonna be working against capitalism while capitalism is dominant, it's gonna be uncomfortable it's gonna mean that you're gonna come up against ideas that are gonna challenge you. It's gonna mean that you're gonna come up against people that are going to try and take whatever power you've managed to scrounge up. Um, but it's not going to be a, a simple process where you sign up for a newsletter or follow an Instagram account and like, now you're part of the movement. Um, it's, it's gonna come from actually getting in front of people and struggling with them through organization. It can't happen individually. There's no one lifestyle option to like, oh, okay, I'm doing it now. <laughs> you have to join a group, you know? That, that's just, to me, the, that's like, that's point one, right? Is you're not gonna do it by yourself. And we can start with the acknowledgement, and that's what I would kind of wanted to clarify because I started that conversation of let's acknowledge each other. Yes, let's acknowledge each other, and then let's build organization so that we can build power, because that's the way it comes. No, I'm just wrapping up the the live stream with Instagram and YouTube. Thanks everybody online for joining us. Uh, now it's an open space for everyone to start their own conversation and discussions. Thanks New York. Thanks Gabe, Sibyl, Tallahassee. Uh, I believe we had some people from outside the U.S. join us as well. For Lauderdale, for Lauderdale. Uh, wow, we have someone from Germany watching us. <laughs> So thank you guys for making this successful. Sorry we had some technical difficulties, technical difficulties. We'll get better as we go. Thank you.